So let me invite the great panel up to stage. And I think we're actually being, first of all, going to have a couple of words, I think, from Peter Thompson, UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, and Christoph Wolf, who's the Head of Mobility Industries from WEF. Do you guys want to say something quickly? And then we'll get the panel up. And I think rather than call the panel up and have them sit looking down on you for too right. long, let's have your opening remarks and then we'll Very good. Up. OK. Um, I think I'm mic'd up. Yeah, I am. Sorry, I walk away with these things occasionally. So yeah. whoever the technician is, get it off me before I leave. Um, <laughs> this is such an important issue for sustainable development goals. Uh, for the, I'm sure I'm preaching the converted here, but the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, are humanity's recipe. Yes, humanity's. All 193 governments of this planet decided on them after years and years of negotiation. Is humanity's plan for survival of our species on this planet, without which we are placing our grandchildren in great, great jeopardy. So this is a very important uh, subject. Why? It touches on many SDGs. Obviously, SDG 14, the ocean goal, very important to us. There are a couple of targets within SDG 14 which relate directly to the decarbonisation of shipping, uh, marine pollution, for example. Uh, so, um, when you think about the other SDGs, though, you know, uh, the, the maritime sector touches on, obviously, SDG 7, uh, clean and affordable energy. Uh, it obviously affects uh, food supplies, which is, uh, you know, the food SDG. The, uh, uh, it goes uh, into all aspects of the sustainable development goals. So we are watching this sector with great interest. And when I say we, I mean not just the United Nations, all of us are watching this sector. Because you'll remember that in the Paris Agreement, the civil aviation industry and the shipping industry were given a sort of special place since no government particularly controls them. They were, ICAO and IMO were given the job of convening the uh, civil aviation industry and the shipping industry to come up with their own targets uh, as to how they were going to help us uh, achieve our Paris Agreement goals. So uh, uh, leave civil aviation out, they're, they're going that mainly on the offset route at the moment. But I'm happy to say that uh, with the International Maritime Organization based in London, uh, which is a combination of uh, governments and uh, shipping lines, uh, shipping companies, that they have come up with an initial strategy, that's what it's called, the initial strategy for uh, decarbonizing, which is to cut the uh, emissions of the global fleet by 50%, the, the GHG emissions, by 50% by 2050. Now, a lot of people groaned and said, my God, that's not enough. And I think you'll hear from the panel that, in fact, uh, some of the really big players like Maersk are uh, much more ambitious than that. But, uh, you know, let not the perfect stand in the way of progress. And uh, this was a really good announcement because IMO have uh, dedicated themselves to improving on that target. But at least we've got a target now. And that was really important because the way things were trending... Uh, the emissions from the global fleet were expected to be about 17% of our GHG emissions by 2050. They're currently at about 3% of our GHG emissions, which would, if you put them out in country terms, that would make them the sixth largest emitter if they were a country, the size of Germany. So really important what IMO is, uh, is uh, deciding there. Um, I've said many times over the last couple of days, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm a grandfather, and therefore I have to be a pragmatist. I have to make sure that through governance and through cooperation with the relevant business sectors, in this case the shipping industry, we are putting pragmatic steps in place and we are implementing them, holding ourselves accountable to the targets that we're setting. So uh, I think you will hear from uh, experts on this panel who and I'm going to sit right down there and listen to them because uh, this, as I said, is a very important Great. area for all of us. Thank you. Christoph, anything to add quickly before we get the panel? Yeah, so, so very quickly. Um, so I'm Christoph Wolf uh, and I'm working at the forum um, leading the mobility industries. Um, I got intrigued as you on by visiting the uh, IMO conferences. Um, shipping is basically a sector which is not so, you don't see it, uh, so it's a little bit outside the, uh, the, the public sphere. 
Um, but the one thing I can say, we, had a, we, had a, we are having a, quite a number of, of, uh, of discussions here uh, at Davos this year. So you see, it's actually coming to the forefront. There's a lot of new momentum initiatives. Um, the Global Maritime Forum actually brought together uh, um, a lot of players. And uh, in our sessions uh, yesterday, where we basically had uh, all, all the supply chain players, especially those who are the customers of the shipping sector, so, so the big forwarders. So they were saying, we made actually a commitment to be zero carbon by 2050 anyway, so we expect the shipping sector to move along this way. And then we had the big, um, the big shippers, the original shippers, like the, the Unilevers and, and, and others. They were saying, exactly, we need to move along the same way. And it, it builds, it needs different groups to work together. It needs the fuel industry to work together, the ports, etc. So many to work together to coordinate. But we are, I, from the last couple of days in, here in Davos, I come, um, I come with a lot of optimism. And I'm very looking forward to what we hear now. Great. Well, it's always good to be optimistic. The sun's shining. Um, let's have our wonderful panel come up. Um, we have um, Klaus Hemmingsen, who is the vice CEO of Maersk, company known to all of you. Um, maybe he is going to be the next shipping Elon Musk, perhaps, um, without such the contro or, well, all, the, all the controversy in radio stations. Um, we've got Lord Adair Turner, who has been a figure in the UK government and policy making for many years, on, originally on the financial side, which is where I first knew him, but he's now deeply involved in environment, and he's here because he's heading the Energy Transition Commission. And we have Brian Worthington, who's the executive director from Europe of the Environmental Defence Fund. So we have a shipping, um, shipping CEO. We've got someone who's involved in trying to push through policy. And then we have an environmental group, an NGO. So let me start with you, Klaus. Um, so the IMO has come out with its 50% reduction targets. But you don't think that's ambitious enough, do you? Um, no, not for the shipping industry, but let me make one thing clear before we go down that route, because we are 100% supporters of the IMO target, and I think it's important to say uh, that we are not doing anything to try to undermine the movement that, that Peter was mentioning, because I think it's fantastic that the IMO has come out with, with, with an ambitious target that is not bringing offsetting into the, the, the game, but I really want to cut nominal uh, factual uh, emissions mm -hmm. by 50% uh, by 2050, which is a, a statement and a, and a very good target. And we are so fortunate that we have the IMO governing the whole maritime right. industry. Let me also just make a reference. Uh, Christoph said that, uh, that uh, you don't see shipping. Well, I, I'll make a bet that uh, you would not like me to take everything off you that you uh, wouldn't have on you if it was not for shipping. Uh, you would not have your mobile devices. Uh, you would not have a lot of the stuff that you use every day. So maybe you don't see shipping. But as we have uh, sustainable development goal number eight, that is, if I get it right, uh, about uh, sustainable and inclusive economic growth, 80% of global trade is carried by shipping, not by planes and trucks, but by shipping. And without those 80% of cargo moved around the world, I think we would have uh, severe difficulties uh, uh, raising people out of poverty and, and uh, supporting uh, sustainable goal number eight. That was a long introduction. But yeah. let me just then add then that uh, in, in MERSC, we have actually reduced our carbon um, emission per container mile transported by 46% over the last 12 years. That also makes us pretty good at, at having an insight in how much more can we reduce it. And that is why we came out with an ambitious target that say in order to achieve the, the, uh, the Paris Accord and what the maritime industry needs to support the Paris Accord with, we need to see carbon neutral shipping by 2050. And, and uh, that's why we, uh, we made the, the goal. If you can imagine a ship that is built for 25 years, if you want carbon neutral shipping in 2050, you need to start replacing the vessels in 2030. In order to do that, you need research and development to take place over the next 10 years. And that is the cry for, or the rallying cry that we have, uh, that we have put out there and we are ready to lead it and support it. So essentially you're saying 100% reduction, not 50%. Um, but if you're going to need those kind of ships, those new Teslas of the sea, as it were, do you have any in the pipeline? No, we haven't, don't. haven't got any in your pocket. You can, you know, unveil there, to this audience. There is a Tesla at the sea because you have short sea shipping that is sort of a one, two hour, sixty kilometer crossings yep. that are actually yep. running on batteries. So it's not like it's not possible, but yep. we cannot see the solution for ocean going shipping. Uh, so we do not have the solution. I do not believe that Elon Musk had the solution to the Tesla when he had the dream. So. Um, 
Right. Adair, you're um, nodding with great knowledge and conviction. Do you think it's going to be possible to create ships that have zero emissions anytime soon? Yes. Um, so in the Energy Transition Commission, we've been working over the last year on six hard-to-abate sectors, steel, cement, chemicals, aviation, shipping, trucking. And we're absolutely confident that every single one of those could be zero emissions by 2060, we've said, but real zero emissions, not buying offsets from the land use sector at a very low cost to the global economy. In the arena of shipping, I think there may well be a role for straight electrification for local riverine, for coastal, and we've seen Norway already say that all their internal shipping, they want to have completely zero carbon by 2025, and that will involve a large element of electric. But the fact is, if you'd worked out how big a battery you need to take a container ship from Pearl River Delta to Rotterdam, you'll find that the weight is just impossible unless we can get breakthroughs in energy density of about five times. We may get those, but we're unlikely to. So the predominant route is probably, probably still going to be some form of combustion engine. It might be an engine working on biodiesel, and shipping should be one of the areas where we think about using biodiesel, unlike on cars and trucks, where it's complete waste of the world's a sustainable bioenergy resource, because we have other ways to decarbonize that. Or it may be that we will run ships in future on ammonia. You can burn ammonia, ammonia in ship engines. I think people are trying to work out how much you have mm. to retrofit them. But the retrofit may not be absolutely complete. So ship engines, I think, are quite robust old things, which we can put a lot of stuff through, unlike aviation engines, where you have to produce the absolute precise chemical equivalent of an aviation jet fuel. Ammonia can be made from hydrogen, well it is made from hydrogen, that's how you make ammonia, and hydrogen can be made in a zero carbon fraction from electrolysis uh, of uh, water with renewable energy. So there are a variety of different technologies. We don't know where exactly the balance will be, but there are enough of these possible technologies that we're absolutely convinced that we can do it. Now, final point, I don't think this is gonna be zero cost. I think there are some sectors of the economy like auto, where people are going to be better off because of the move to electric cars. They're going to spend less on transport services than they do uh, today. But I think shipping like aviation is probably one where it's going to cost us a bit more. But run some figures. Even if the freight cost of shifting a pair of jeans from Bangladesh to the UK went up, or Europe went up 100%, the cost of the jeans are going to go up less than 1%. So we can and we should accept somewhat higher freight costs, if we have to accept them, and I think we probably will, confident that the impact of that on consumer living standards is actually really rather trivial. That's fascinating. Well, I'm going to come later, back later on and ask who's going to actually fund this R&D, because obviously that's quite important. But, Bryony, is this good enough for you? Are you feeling happy when you hear this, these pledges and all the potential research breakthroughs? Um, well, um, the Environmental Defence Fund decided a couple of years ago to focus in on shipping because it was uh, we saw it as a sector that could actually be faster than some other sectors for some of the reasons that have been outlined today. And um, we, we were happy when the IMO set their target. We were even happier when Musk said they were going to beat that and go to 100%. Um, but what we're focused on is using the IMO, which is pretty, uh, it's a pretty astounding thing that we have a sectoral governance system yeah. that can set rules for the whole globe. At a time when, let's face it, multilateralism is a little bit down the dumps, this is one little shining light where you can get policies through. Um, it uses qualified majority voting, so you don't even need consensus. Mm. Um, and, it's, and it's a rulemaking body for, for the whole globe. So, and they've just started now on this uh, process of designing the policies that are going to get us there. And I, I think that you know, working with the industry, working with um, forward-looking countries, we can craft policies which, which basically bring these technologies that Adair's outlined into a more commercial um, potential because we're going to have to internalise the fact that we're emitting all these greenhouse gases. And once we put a price on that and recycle the funds that we raise from that, we can support the kind of innovation that we need to get these, these new technologies, these new fuels out on the water. And it's not beyond uh, imagination that this could be a policy that's crafted within the next well, one to two years in the IMO and then starts to bring in the kind of big flows of capital that we need to make these ships right. on the water as soon as we can. Because just, you know, the context for all of this 
is that we need to bend the curve in global greenhouse gas emissions as fast as possible. Um, last year, you know, we, we saw that emissions are rising again on a global level. Every part of the global economy now has a real role to play in trying to bend that curve as fast as possible. Shipping has some great advantages in terms of being able to move a little bit faster than some of the others, and that's why we're really committed to helping the IMO and, and the sector move forward. Right. Well, I must say, I do find this sector fascinating because although I'm absolutely not an expert in transport, I've spent much of my life looking at, or much of my career looking at finance instead, the fact you actually <coughs> have a workable international organisation, the IMO, which can actually do things you know, as you say, through qualified majority voting, is remarkable and very encouraging. The question I have, though, really, is for you, Klaus. I mean, you, as Maersk, have been upright Dane Scandinavians. You've said you're going to try and drive forward this green agenda. Lots of other shipping companies have come on board. But there are also a lot of other shipping companies which are not quite as excited by this, um, you know, particularly in some of the third world areas. Um, particularly some of the areas which are less transparent, where there aren't shareholders breathing down their neck. How on earth are you actually going to monitor, track and corral behaviour across a sector that's actually very, very fragmented? That is a very deep question that will take a long time to answer, but let me, let well, me, do, try, it short. Let me do it short and, and just say that is, that is uh, perhaps the reason that we uh, come out with our... Uh, what our target setting uh, just after IMO came out with their target setting, which we again find impressive, because we are not all like-minded. I mean, so so uh, merged through uh, Danish shipping together with our Scandinavian counterparts, together with like-minded UK, Singapore, others, have been pushing the green agenda in in various bodies and also towards the IMO. And as effective as IMO may be as a governing body. Um, they have not turned out to be fast in policy making and decision making and even though it's qualified majority it does take uh, voting so we do think that events like here with the uh, with the with the wef um, will will simply uh, create a consumer demand and a, a population demand so we do not have to wait for the imo it's great that the imo will follow suit and, and help us and assist but I th we think that the, uh, the uh, society will demand of us that we do more. And that's, that's, that's actually what we are trying to gain momentum for. So but are there going to be any penalties for groups from smaller countries where there's less transparency, less shareholder pressure, um, less governmental pressure? Is there going to be any penalties from them on them to actually stop them polluting? Well, uh, you know, the population of the, of the world will, uh, will vote with their boots and hopefully there will be uh, advantages and benefits for yeah. those that uh, that's go, goes ahead rather than penalising those who, who, who do not follow. I think it will come naturally, that's our belief at least. But, of course, there's two things. We do not want to, uh, we, we want to make sure that first mover initiatives are not getting punished later. So well, we are going to try out a lot of things and not all of them will succeed. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that eventually when the technology is there, IMO has proven over time that they are very good at, at making sure that the right technology is applied for the oceans. Mm. Well, I was going to pick up on that point that at the moment, um, the idea that we're going to be having to change the fuel system of shipping into something cleaner can be seen as you know, an impediment. So, certainly for countries who are further away from markets, they see this as something that may damage their economy. But what we're trying to um, uh, promote is the fact that this is a huge opportunity for investment. And there are some countries who are going to be able to produce some of these fuels using renewables, using their own natural resources. It's going to open up the market for how you propel goods around the planet to many more players. And that's no bad thing. I think most of the bulk shipping is, is you know, the, bulk, the, the fuels are provided by merely you know, a handful of ports. But what if we had, you know, we could sail on solar and we were converting excess renewable electricity into a fuel, then that opens up a whole um, range of countries who could start to provide and use their shipping and using their ports as a way of providing a guaranteed off-taker of the investment into the renewables that they can then uh, exploit. So we can turn this around and sell it as an opportunity for a wide number of countries and that's something we're actively working on at the moment. Adair, I mean, you like me are probably a bit of a cynic. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm, I'm a. No, he's an optimist. I'm a dreaming idealist. <laughs> okay. Well, having covered okay. the financial, having overseen the financial industry for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's quite yeah. something. Um, I'm a cynic about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. Okay. Two questions. Firstly, do you think that there's going to be a way to basically get everybody on board yeah. with this? And secondly, who is going to pay for the R and D? 
Is it going to be governments? Is it going to be, you know, venture okay. capital? Uh, on the first question, I think across all the different sectors, you have to combine a set of different le levers and influence mechanisms. In shipping, we do have this very powerful thing called the IMO, developed originally for safety reasons, the regulation of ships for safety reasons. But as a result, it has a lot of powers to say every ship which is allowed to sail in the world has to meet certain standards. And if you look at what they've done, for instance, on taking the sulfur out of fuel, it's a very effective regulatory mechanism, which, for instance, we don't have in the trucking sector and, and other sectors. However, we need to ally that with other forces. So getting major buyers of freight services to start saying, I want to buy my freight in a zero carbon, low carbon or zero carbon fashion. If Walmart said all its freight purchase is going to be zero carbon, that's a big lever. We had a dinner last night and we were talking with the man from DHL was telling us DHL's plans to drive its trucking and its aviation and its shipping purchases all towards zero carbon. So there, we were with IKEA as well, talking about making sure that they look all the way through their supply chain. So the big buyers of consumer goods, uh, these are, and distributors of consumer goods uh, are important and well. And then there's a point that Bryony made, you know, there are a number of really big ports in the world, particularly in the container area. If you can get Hong Kong and Shanghai and Singapore and Dubai and Rotterdam all to be saying, we are going to be working with the RMO to over time be saying, you know, if you want classic old fossil fuel diesel, uh, HFO, heavy fuel oil, you're going to pay a price for it, uh, essentially sort of, sort of carbon tax, but also planning to put in place the infrastructure if it has to be ammonia or hydrogen. And that's going to be a tricky transition because they're not going to want to invest in the big distribution infrastructures till it's getting clearer out of the work that Klaus and others are doing, which route we're going to go. So there are some tricky coordination challenges, but when you get to the ports, you, there are a small number of dominant big players uh, to coordinate. On the R&D, I'm much less worried than other people about this. And everybody says, how are we going to finance a, a, a low carbon economy? We're always financing changeover in our economies. And this transition to a low carbon economy, yes, it's, it's large, but it's no larger than previous transmissions. And actually, the total amount of investment required is relatively small as a percentage of GDP, relatively small as a percentage of total current investment in a world where negative real interest rates are screaming at us that in macroeconomic terms, we don't seem to have enough in investment relative to attempted global savings. I think most of the R&D will probably be the companies themselves. There are, however, some crucial areas where there will be a public policy uh, uh, role uh, as well. And there are some generic technologies applicable across multiple sectors, which I think it is very important for public policy research and development to support. For instance, driving down the cost of electrolysis equipment mm. will drive down the cost of hydrogen. And therefore, that is one of those things that mission innovation, breakthrough coalitions should be focusing on. If we can get the cost of uh, electrolysis equipment down from $800 to $1,000 uh, per kilowatt it is at the moment to, say, $250 a kilowatt, then you begin to transform the cost of making hydrogen and you make it possible to run electrolyzers for only the couple of thousand hours per year when the renewable energy will be dirt cheap. At the moment, people say to you, how am I going to make hydrogen from renewable energy? Because the economics only work if I'm running my electrolyzers all the year. Get the electrolyzers cheap enough, and we can use renewable energy when it's really cheap to make hydrogen uh, and then to make ammonia. Fascinating. Klaus, you wanted to come in there. I mean, yeah, can you give us a sense of how much you're spending on R&D to do these kind of things? <laughs> well, I can say that over the last four years, we've spent a billion dollars into uh, fuel efficiency and, and, and uh, emission optimization, and we have uh, now 50 engineers working on, on this. So, so and a billion dollars is what in terms of context, in terms of your overall revenue? Or Well, that's in context of... 30, 40 billion dollars revenue per year. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, it's also about how much money can you put to work in the... But anyway, I mean, we are putting uh, substantial efforts in and uh, shipping is a marginal business, so a billion dollars is a lot. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that there's a lot of other initiatives from the Global uh, Maritime Forum, for instance, we were signing a, a, a coalition agreement uh, call for action between uh, various uh, shipping entities across the segments. So not only container shipping, and, and you were there, but also bulk and, and, and tank operators and also commodity traders. 
And that uh, coalition is now signed by more than 50 parties that are, that, that are really rallying around the, uh, uh, this movement and probably doing it in different ways, but there's a un united uh, front there. We've also uh, uh, initiated by the, some of the major banks uh, there's something called the Poseidon Principles that are being worked on so that the finance community will actually against measured, um, um, uh, measured emission and uh, energy efficiencies and other measures to, uh, to, carp to, to curb the carbon emissions, they will differentiate their lending to companies. And that's, that's funding in itself. I mean, yep, it's an yep. indirect, but it will yep. help a lot. <coughs> so there's a lot of movement going on. And, and we are firm believers that if we put a target out there, we will attract engineers, yep. we will attract researchers, yep. we will yep. attract the finance community, our customers. We see for the last two years, a 30% increase mm -hmm. year on year, two years in a row, in uh, large customers who in their tenders include yep. sustainable development goal performance, especially within the environment and climate change. Oh, it's fascinating. I must say, if, if, if any of this plays out, this is going to be a casebook um, for MBA students and economists in five, ten years' time about the power of incentives. We have about 15 minutes left. I'm conscious there are a lot of people in the room who care a lot about this. Um, so let's have <coughs> a few questions. I think we have a roving microphone. Got one question there and then one there. Hello, my name is Martin Brunsko. I run a venture fund out of London. Transportation is one of our areas and actually decarbonization of shipping is something we've been looking at quite a lot. We find it a very fascinating and very important, a potentially very attractive topic. First of all, congratulations to Maersk uh, and huge respect uh, for the leadership role and, and pioneering role you're playing in this area. I have the following question. To what extent do you think the carbon capture uh, from actually existing uh, propulsion technologies, existing yeah. engine, can be a part of the solution as opposed to just really having to move to a completely different type of propulsion solution, or if not a different type of propulsion solution, at least to a different type of uh, fuels. Yeah. Maybe Adair has more comments to that, but let me just say that we are not ruling anything out. Yeah. So we are, move, we are looking at both propulsion solutions and fuel solutions uh, across the board, not ruling anything out. But capturing the, the, the CO2 emissions is not high on our priority list. We do not have much faith that that will solve the problem. Um, but we are not ruling, but maybe you have looked more into well, it. Well, we haven't looked in detail, I have to say, and we tended to assume that where we're dealing with you know, mobile environments and you can't do a really large scale uh, a capture plant as you can do at the back of a seal plant or a back of a cement plant, it's much less likely. So, I mean, there are some areas we're never going to do carbon capture and storage at the back end of a truck. Uh, we're not going to do it at the back end of aviation. Now, is ships, are really big ships, something uh, intermediate? It's not something we've looked at in detail. I wouldn't rule it out. There's actually an innovation company coming to see me in London on Monday morning who say they've got a technology. I don't quite understand it, but... It, Calix? <laughs> Calix? Is it called Calix? Oh, no, well, there's, Great, there's, there's more than one guy. There's competition. And they say they can miniaturize it, and then they also combine it with something, and I haven't quite understood it then, about taking the CO2 and putting it back into the ocean in some, in some fashion, which I think acts against ocean acidification. I didn't understand it, but there's a complicated set of things going on. So, look, we are confident that even with the sort of technologies which we know are almost certainly available, we can get to this zero carbon, but one should never exclude that somebody comes up with, you know, a new variant, and, and, and let's keep open-minded for that. Yeah. Well, this is, I'd say, fascinating and very encouraging. And there are 60,000 ships out there. So the <laughs> 60,000 ships out there. <laughs> um, my name is Andrew Mitchell. I'm representing Morova Natural Capital, which is a billion-dollar impact investment fund, and we have a sustainable ocean fund in our portfolio. Uh, my question, though, is regarding offsets. Uh, like the aviation industry has made a decision to use offsets to uh, increase the speed with which it can yep. effectively reach carbon neutrality. Uh, and it's great to hear about this target uh, by 2050, but there's still going to be a lot of emissions going out between now and then, which could be offset, and that will lead to a cash transfer that could be incredibly useful in other areas, yep. for instance, saving rainforests. Yep. Um, can I have a comment from the panel on if the shipping industry is thinking about that? Well, uh, then, then I can start. So that's going to be a, per a personal comment. I mean, we need to save the rainforest nevertheless. Shipping or no shipping, so uh, so. But we don't. We, we believe first of all that the technology will become available, and uh, and don't forget that the IMO has also set a target of uh, reduction of uh, emissions uh, by 2030 yeah. of uh, 40 percent from uh, you know relative uh, reductions, 
And, uh, and we, have, we have reached that already, and we have a 60% target in MERSC by 2030, which is possible. So it's not like nothing is done in the short term. I think it's very important to balance the two. But we just don't find offsetting. I, we, of course, understand the, 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 uh, the um, generation of funds and, and money, but we do not uh, consider that as an efficient tool, net-net. I mean, that's just going to be an excuse to keep on running on old technology, if you can pay for it. So. That, that's, we, we would rather have the targets without offsetting. Any more and questions? That's a most view. <laughs> Lots of questions. Right, we've got one there and then over here. So, so James Sprouting, uh, Nissan's Capital. Thank you very much. I, so I, I, I mean, there's a lot of sunk costs in the business and ships last a long time. And yep. uh, so I guess there's going to be an, an intermediate steps to get to, to where you'd like to go. But I had understood that the, that the actually the oil industry, you actually could get... Uh, is sort of low sulfur sulfur fuel, yeah, and yep. you have to sort of put pressure on the the oil companies to do that, and that that seems to be a bit of the obstacle. So I, I, I'm just curious if that's that's accurate, and if so, what could be done? To I can see Brian well, well, dying to jump yep. in here, so I'm going to let. Well, I was just going to say in response to the earlier conversation about electrolysis that um, one of the side effects of the IMO having passed regulations to take sulfur out of the fuel supply chain, which kick in in January, this coming January, has been to bring down the cost of electrolysis because one of the ways you scrub out that from the fuel supply chain is it can be using electrolysis. So the oil industry is shifting. Um, the IMO uh, made a decision to allow two forms of compliance with those rules. One is to go for low sulfur fuel. The other is to use a scrubber, which is a little bit of capture and storage, to take the sulfur out and dispose of it. Um, so the shipping industry is taking two routes. Um, it, it would have been, I think, probably more sensible to just give one option and to have just gone for the fuels. But we'll see. And economics will, will, will tell which are the most successful of those choices over time. But, you know, in a sense, what the, my concern, if I have one, I'm generally optimistic, is that we are dealing with sulfur, which is probably, you know, an issue that's two decades old in terms of when we should have dealt with it, and at just at the time when we should be dealing with climate change. And we need to integrate quickly <coughs> our climate policies and our, and our air quality policies so that shippers can make decisions that tackle both. At the moment, it's sequential. They're dealing with the air quality now, incurring capital costs, and it's causing you know, change, but it's, it's not the kind of systemic change we want to see to tackle climate change. So the IMO has to catch up quickly on climate change. It's a, it's a small issue compared to carbon. Yeah, I mean, and the essence of it is, I mean, yes, the oil companies in their refining, they can produce mm. low sulfur hydrocarbons, but you can't produce low ki carbon hydrocarbons. <laughs> I mean, Unless you do hydrogen. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Well, you can produce low carbon hydros, but not hydrocarbons. So, you know, in order to end up with zero carbon, unless you think there's a, uh, there's a carbon capture route, unless you think that, you've fundamentally got to stop booking hydrocarbons into, uh, into uh, 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 ship engines. In, yeah. But if you, get, if you get carbon capture storage working, which is still you know, to be proven at commercial scale, you could do onshore capture and then use the hydrogen from the fossil fuels. I mean, that is one vector that's open, but that's you know, to be decided. I'm fascinating. Sorry, Peter, you want to come yeah, in? Yeah, um, look, um, I'm a fifth generation Fijian. My great great grandfather arrived in Fiji as a master <laughs> mariner, uh, obviously under sail and traded out of Fiji uh, under sail for the rest of his life. Thousands of years before that, every island in the Pacific was populated by discoverers and traders uh, from Hawaii to New Zealand, back and forward for thousands of years by sail. <coughs> Does sail and possibly solar have a role in this future which we're envisaging? And as a rider to that, can I say uh, that, uh, as I understand it, slowing shipping down does not have much of a negative economic impact, might be an improvement, in fact. There's a well, fascinating you, you, questions. Yeah. I think you would speak to an economist about that because I think the efficiency of, uh, of world trade is also something to do with speed. And, and shipping has slowed down. I remember uh, 20 years ago we were yep. building ships that ran 28 knots for, for commercial trade. Today they run 15, 16, 16, <laughs> uh, 17 knots. So that is part of the efficiency. So shipping has slowed down in order to curb the, uh, the carbon footprint. But there's a, there's a balance between what does trade need in terms of inventory on the water, in terms of speed to market, and all these things that we all enjoy as human beings. So, but certainly there's a balance. And, and sales are being uh, tested on, on ships that are uh, more likely to benefit from that than container ships. Uh, so, so if you have a flat tanker or you have a bulk carrier, we actually, most tankers have a ship sailing now with 
fixed yep. sales to see what is the impact of that. So yep. when I say no stone is unturned, I think it depends on which segment you're in, what will help. So, yep. yeah. so if any of you see a ship, a masked ship with sails on it, take a photograph. Yeah, well, well, they, well, they, they, like they sometimes the they sometimes don't yeah, look like right. sails. They're sometimes these cylinders, a, uh, and I think the way to think about sail is it's a way of uh, of basically reducing the need for whatever the fuel is. I mean, I don't think anybody That's envisions right. that we're going to be using bulk carriers or container ships which are entirely sail. But with sail assist um, may well mean that the total fuel use, whether it's ammonia or biodiesel, might be twenty or thirty percent less right. than it would be without that sail assist. So it's it is. A serious idea, and there are a variety of different specific sail technologies being looked at. And on, and on the solar, <coughs> I mean, the, the advantage of solar, really, you need large areas of land. Yeah, yeah. So for it to, to be able to sail on solar, you need to have big gigawatt-scale investment into countries which have got vast deserts, and then have a conversion from that into a, a propulsion fuel. So yeah. finding those ports which have got that kind of land with the, the demand of a shipper to take off the, the yeah. be the off taker could be one of these ways in which we get capital into I the mean, sector. I mean, you, you can put solar panels on the ship, but yeah, the but total amount you get is going to be peanuts. far short of transformation or yeah. just because of yeah. the area. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. <coughs> if um, anyone has mm, any stand. more questions. Yeah. All stunned. Last point was about you know if you have uh, a good energy sector which is based on renewable energies. I mean, in my country Fiji, Fiji was seventy percent hydro, yeah. but like Norway, uh, and you know plug in the ship if it's a, what yeah. twenty four hours I think is about the max you can do on electrical at the moment. And there are ferries in the Nordic countries which are now ferrying large amounts of freight yeah. from uh, across the sea just on electric propulsion. I mean, on electric, we, we, I, I mean, River Rhine, um, that'll all go electric. Um, uh, you know, cross-channel ferries, electric. I think an interesting area is shorter distance cruise. I mean, the point about cruise is it needs a hell of a lot of electricity in any case, you know, for the air conditioning, etc. So they may choose with the shorter distance cruises uh, to say, let's just try and turn this all over to electric. Maybe that's where hydrogen will play its biggest role because, um, but, but once it's, you know, cross-Atlantic cruise, you know, setting off from Europe and going to the Caribbean, you're into the same game as, you know, yeah. container or bulk. Uh, we can't quite see uh, the energy storage uh, limitations working at the moment. So it will be a variety of different technologies for different sectors of the industry. And, and, and it will be in different countries as well. So um, although the IMO is going to try and harmonise, you've got certain countries. I mean, Denmark's been leading, Norway leads. The UK today has just published its Maritime 2050 strategy, and it's coming to the game to say we want to be a place where people invest in, in low-carbon shipping. And they're starting to consult on an incentive mechanism to bring investment into the UK. And we've already got um, a short-sea ferry in the Orkneys, which is running on excess wind, um, on hydrogen. So, you know, there are lots of these little niche uh, examples which over time will scale. And it's, right. we need leadership from countries, country, com companies, and we need the IMO. Mm. We're almost out of time. I can see two hands waving. So let me hear those two, about three, three very quick questions. Okay, points. Yeah, one. Anna Grossman. I'm interested in the impact of distributed manufacturing, um, 3D printing on cross trans uh, cross-ocean okay. travel, and is that going to make a difference in the shipping industry? Okay, and let's have that common question there, and then we'll wrap up. There's one over here, and then one at the very well, back, quickly. It, so hang on to that for just a minute. Oh, I okay, want to hear, hear the three questions. Uh, Patrick Mangdorf, just a very quick question about food and the whole issue about changing, you mentioned yep. about um, using biofuels, but surely we should be thinking about growing different types of food and not transporting nearly so much food by ship. Okay, so these are all connection, connected to the question, do we just do less shipping to solve the problem? And one last, and then you can each have a quick minute comment on this at the end. Yes, my question is in line with the previous ones because uh, the concept of the circular economy is being dis discussed uh, a lot around here as well, shifting from a linear economy, a take-make-waste economy, to a circular economy, which will have large implications for global trade, the quantity of products, the quantity yep. of resources being dragged around right. the globe. Yep. What's your perspective on that and how could the shipping industry adapt and have a role in that, um, in that, in that world? Okay, last word from each of you for about a minute on that point. Is the best way to deal with shipping emissions to just do less shipping? Well, I think there are some opportunities for less shipping, and, and we looked at them. It may be that there will be less 
uh, man manufacturing, shipping in future, ship moving manufactured goods, because it's possible that with radical automation possibilities, we are going to see the return of manufacturing to the rich developed world uh, in a very robotized and automated fashion. It's also possible that different patterns of a uh, food production uh, may mean that less of it is shipped ar around the world. On the other hand, there are some other things where we can see a zero carbon economy needing new forms of shipping, for instance, of hydrogen and ammonia. I think we are going to see a major international trade of moving ammonia or hydrogen from places of the world where renewable energy is very, very, very cheap, like Mexico, uh, northern uh, uh, Chile, uh, Sahara, uh, Saudi, uh, to places where it is need. The other bit, big bit of bulk uh, which will disappear and has got to disappear is thermal coal. I mean, there's a big element of bulk carrying of thermal coal, and hopefully by 2050 or 2060, we want to be doing none of that. But when we looked at the balance of all of this, we still thought this was going to be a growing industry. Uh, and, and these things will reduce the rate of growth, but we can't see it actually reducing the total amount of, of, of shipping activity. Brian? Um, yeah, a pretty similar response, I suppose. Um, I, actually, you know, sh don't forget shipping has got physics in its favour, so it can move heavy things more efficiently than most forms of yep. transport, apart perhaps from very high-speed rail. Um, so bulk of any kind, which, I mean, let's be honest, I think shipping has helped bring people out of poverty and lifted the you know, human kind of cause quite substantially. 80% of world trade is an, an insignificant amount of money that's been flowing out of rich countries into more, into more developing countries. So we still need that kind of flow. Um, and I, I do think that ships, once they're clean, um, and if they can do it cheaply, we'll be able to outcompete maybe some of our re our road um, infrastructure because we could have more short sea ships taking bulk and taking containers out to smaller ports. So this is a you know there's a vision for shipping where it starts to actually outcompete some of the harder to decarbonize sectors because it can do it cheaply and efficiently. That's where we want to get to. That said, all the po points about you know more local production and circular economies. That over time, we may well see that there's less need for cars to be moving around the planet. But I don't think shipping's going to disappear. Fascinating. I can't imagine that Turkey's vote for Christmas. They're so not going to say less shipping. <laughs> no, no, <but> well, <laughs> we do believe, as I said, that, that we will see a general growth. But these, uh, the examples mentioned will certainly uh, help to, to reduce the growth, if you like. But we still see growth. But don't forget that shipping is used to dealing with fluctuations in the market. I don't know if, if you can imagine an old 28-inch uh, TV set, how many that could be in a container. And then today you have a flat screen yeah. that takes out no space in a container. So, and, and these are not small, uh, small impacts on the volume that we actually move yeah. on the oceans. So across the shipping segments, I think we will adapt. And that's not something we are, we are, we are not used to. We've done it for a couple of hundred years. Um, so so, so we, are, we believe that there will still be growth, to answer that question. To your question about the food, we are very conscious about if, when we say a, a net zero carbon shipping solution, it is not on the account of food. So we need to, if it's biofuel, yeah. if it's biofuel, then we need to find a biofuel um, uh, system or, or, or biomass that is not impacting the, uh, the food supply. So we're very aware of that, and it's, it's, it's in our charter for the project. Yes. Well... I must say, I've been in Davos now for three days. It feels like three years already. Um, a lot of the conversations I've had have been pretty darn depressing. But I find this conversation one of the more optimistic and encouraging ones, not just because you actually do have an industry which is getting together, and goodness only knows we need a bit more multilateral collaboration these days, um, but we also have an industry which has actually been pretty hard-headed about trying to bring in some of the financial incentives and economic incentives and setting targets um, so I hope this works for the sake yeah. of us all and good luck. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.